Yay, we're here at last. I think I've been asking you to do this for like four years. Uh, yeah, <laughs> something. I don't know. <laughs> Since we worked together on, oh, what did we do? We worked, we worked on a couple underwater. of things. It was underwater. That we, we talked, I think we were talk, talking maybe before that a little bit, but yeah, underwater I think was the thing. And I was like, oh, you should come on my podcast. It would be great to talk to you because you have such a wonderful energy um, and that, I think that's a really unique thing to have in this space. Um, and you always had it. So, yeah. So I'm really happy we're here. Thank and you. For those that are listening, it's like, this is like four or five years in the making. Uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's awesome to be here. Quite busy. Always fun to uh, chat with other amazing creatives. So. Uh, well, yeah, I, it, was, it was cool. I was like, um, I was doing some recon on knowing that we're going to do this. And I was like watching through the signal again and underwater and like just kind of going through the, just like your cinematography and your background and everything. It's been really cool. And I also like read about you too, which is also interesting having known you, but then reading about you and <laughs> seeing kind of where your journey comes yeah. from. Uh, it's cool. Your, your, your process and your path has been really interesting. It seems like you were mostly motivated at the start by your grandfather. I think it was that I read. Oh yeah. Uh, my grandfather was a filmmaker in the, in the Navy actually. So, um, I mean, motivated by lots of things, but, um, that was just, it's a really, you know, it was always interesting growing up and seeing all the crazy stuff that he had shot on super 16 and, you know, kind of, he would do experimental Navy films and on like G forces and just weird, you know, he was a cameraman essentially just pointing the camera at crazy things that the Navy wanted to catch and, you know, high speed photography and, uh, they were doing like early three dimensional type stuff with multiple lenses. They were doing all kinds of interesting things. So growing up and hearing his stories was always uh, very inspiring and, and uh, just interesting. You know, as a kid, you're like, wow, that's so interesting. You can go work in the military, but just be a shooter, you know? Uh, yeah. So. A camera shooter. Yeah. yeah. A camera shooter. <laughs> Not a gun shooter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He would always tell the story that's, that he that's flew crazy. under the Golden Gate Bridge a couple of times and, you know, wow. filmed it out the under window. It? Yeah. Under, which I guess, you know, it's very rare. Wow. Not too many people are allowed to do that. Yeah. I would say very few people have ever done that yeah. <laughs> to fly underneath there. Wow. That's really cool. And, and how would you present those to you? Because this is old media. So would it be like on a projector or? Yeah, well, he had, they had given him copies. Like eventually, they had put it onto a, a disc of some sort and given it to him. Oh, they so, archived it. Yeah, so oh, it was. That's cool. I don't know if it was from a disc or if it was from like a a website or whatever. But eventually, he showed a lot of his footage to us, which was pretty cool. Damn, that's such a cool. What a legacy, too. Yeah. And what an interesting life that is, and to also be influenced by somebody that's that prolific and has done such a unique role. Because, like you said. Who would have thought that that was even a job or a task yeah, for the, I think, for such you know, a thing, it wasn't you know? really something he was setting out to do. I think it was, he was a good mm -hmm. photographer and, um, mm -hmm. it just worked out. He was in the Navy. They saw his photography skill and they're like, Oh, you should do some stuff like this. And I think he always felt it was very blue collar and not very creative. It was very just like, mm -hmm. we got work to do, you know, at least that's how, you sure. know, that was his mantra. It was like, um, very like one foot in front of the next. So I don't think he ever yeah. saw it as That's like a generation of people. Yeah. Though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He didn't, he didn't see it as like this, not, you know, he didn't, but he also was a, the type of person who didn't really like to toot his own horn. So he was just like, Oh yeah, mm -hmm. just a job or, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, <laughs> but I uh, love that. Yeah. He was a cool guy. <laughs> very cool guy. That's wonderful. Is your grandpa still around? No, no. He passed away. It was, mm -hmm. Uh, kind of, he was kind of crazy cause I would go, he lived in Salt Lake city. And so mm. I would see him yearly mm. for Sundance. Um, cause That's we right. would always go up there and, and it was, it was too bad. He passed away like right before I got into Sundance. So, cause he would always be like, uh, Oh, you're going to have a film there one before day. Before the signal? Yeah. It was just it was the, the signal or was it love? Which one? Uh, the was signal. Love in there yeah. Too? The signal. Oh, uh, the signal. Okay. Um, Damn, because he was like the one telling you to get into yeah, it, Yeah, right? if Love had gone there, to right? Sundance, he would have been able to check it out. But unfortunately, oh, man. yeah, it was a little too late. But, you know, it was yeah. still special. What was your grandpa's name? Charles. Yeah. Charles? Oh, yeah. Man. 
Hats off to Charles. Yeah, hats off what to a Charles. Bad dude, sounds like <laughs> big, big guy. Gotta love that. There was a famous picture of him. Yeah. I'd have to try to find it. It was like on. It was in a National Geographic, and because he was, he was very into wildlife. Like just loved like bears and you know just really into Indian stuff. Like his whole house was full of like crazy turquoise jewelry, and um, he had all these like Navajo. Uh, rugs and he just loved like American Indian stuff and, and, and animals like wolves and bears. And some famous photographer took a picture of him when he was much older, sitting on a chair in Yellowstone National Park, just in the middle of the road on this like long, just desolate, you know, stretch of highway. And my granddad's just with his crazy withered face is just like hunched over on this chair in the middle of the right on the yellow line. <laughs> And it, the, like it just said photo. old coyote, uh, but he was a very <laughs> tall man. He was a huge man. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, I'll have to find that picture and send it to you. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I'd love to see it. Yeah. That sounds amazing because we are who who we we are created by really for, yeah. for the most part, especially yeah. when we're that impressionable. When you're saying all these things about him, I'm seeing flashes of things that are influenced you. I would imagine through like the signal and especially the signal. I would imagine too because that that was kind of that was kind of like you're, you're kind of launching off from there and taking so much. I mean, love obviously was a, was a passion, a very bunch of a passion love project. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I mean, we'll get into that too, but yeah, I thought that that was, that's really cool. And to live in Salt Lake city, I really love Utah. Utah is yeah. just so ripe with nature. It's stunning up there. Every time I get a chance to get up there, beautiful, beautiful uh, country. I'll just take the Raptor up there and it's just, it's like the Raptor was built to be there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just love ripping it up up there. And yeah, it's such a beautiful that's place. That's awesome. Yeah. He, my dad grew up in Ogden, Utah. And um, okay. then they moved to uh, Salt Lake later, and that's where my granddad was until the end. So good dude. And then oh, my parents have a little yeah. condo up in Park City, so that always made it easy. Oh, Whether or not I was doing anything in Sundance, it was easy to get up there and cause a ruckus. Beautiful. Park City is so beautiful, yeah. too. I love it up there. And I was just up there recently. Do you still – you're into automotive as well. Didn't you have like a Bronco? Yeah, or the FJ40, or like Toyota FJ40. FJ40. Oh, That's what right. a nightmare. Yeah. It's like, still doing that? I, um, <laughs> I love it. It's my third FJ40. The other ones I had when I was younger, just up on the ranch up in uh, Santa Barbara. And uh, this one, like I, I was just getting into this guy in Burbank to take it all, fix it all up and um, – to get the engine where it's a it belches black smoke and it makes your Dr. Pepper taste funny after you've driven it for a little while. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm like literally trying to get it out of the garage and I blow, I Those totally really burn now. through the wiring harness and oh. <laughs> I had to push it back into its spot and it's just sitting oh. there waiting for me to start the process. So anyways, it's a process. Yeah. Yeah. You have to love those things because they're literally a, a, a nuisance to yeah. deal with. Once you get Until it right, you get it it's right. good. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been around yeah, this just long. Just throw an LS in there. Yeah. Just throw an LS in there and be done with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's awesome, though. I, I remember I was on my 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 dad's brother is really into the FJ thing, and they do this like FJ cruise where they have like the new FJs and the old ones and like a, a slew of different builds in between, and they'd go on this big journey up through like Northern California and camp out, and it's just like there's like 100 FJs out wow. there. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like something. Up by Tahoe? Really is, it, is it the trucky thing? <laughs> I think it's Tahoe. Yeah. I think that's, that's what it is. That's a big, famous... Uh, there's a famous run that they do up there. Forgot what it's called. Whatever yeah. that trail is. FJ run or something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And the trail is so gnarly. Like yeah. um, traversing down that? into it is crazy. There's the famous, there's yeah, a lot of to... famous problems on it that people always read about. Like the, the little sluice box and the sluice. I, I you know, if you read four wheel drive yeah. magazines, it's, they cover the whole <laughs> thing. So anyways, <laughs> it's cool though. It's a good excuse. I, I've, I've always been into cars, but my Raptor is the first truck I've ever owned. Oh, really? And it's the first time I really realized like, oh, this is a whole nother thing. Yeah. yeah. So now when I drive the Raptor, I'm looking at fire roads on mountains and I'm like, yeah. oh, I want to just, I'm just going to go up there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so, it's what a wonderful experience to, especially being American and being in America, we have so, so much nature here. Yeah. And it's like, it's so wonderful to get out of the office and, and go into it, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, that's yeah. kind of like the classic. There's always like that battle over like, because a lot of people will get mad that you drive your car off road into nature, you know, and you're like, well, 
Sure. You know, but Fair these enough. are the people who like love going there, you know, but yeah, it's a yeah. balance like anything else. It's just a balance of, well, if you stay on the fire road, yeah, I mean, exactly. the fire road's there. Exactly. And it's there for fire prevention. So yeah. I don't go and drive off of it so, <laughs> yeah. unless I'm in the desert and yeah. then I don't care. So <laughs> totally. <laughs> We just, uh, a group of friends just went out to Borrego. I was supposed to go, but I got really sick. But yeah, that out in Borrego, have you been down into Borrego no. and all that stuff? No, where is that at? Uh, it's, um, it's like, uh, like south of Mojave Desert and it's just out there. It's really beautiful. Okay. There. But all of these things, like I'm also, I think similar, you probably, your mind never shuts off. So when you're, wh- wherever you're at, you're like, I could make a, sh- I could film here. I could make a shot here. Yeah. This could happen here. And yeah. Yeah. That's kind of how your process, I think we talked about it with the signal was, I think that you guys shot it in New Mexico and Ohio. Or yeah. We were, the two uh, locations? Yep. yeah, we did majority of the shoot in, uh, just outside of Albuquerque. And then we did like a week and a half, maybe a week in Ohio, um, for some of the memory sequences and whatnot. So, like That's the right. road trip, like sequence. the upside down frame. Yeah, right? yeah, I shot uh, that. I love that shot so <laughs> much. Yeah. I took that. Yeah. You want to know where that came from? I'll tell you. Uh, that came. The inspiration came from a Louis Vuitton commercial I saw. Hmm. I think it was hmm. a Louis Vuitton commercial. Those commercials are great at showcasing up and coming artists. You know, I think uh, Fincher found uh, Darius Kanji's work from like a Gucci thing or something. Oh, wow. And he was like, let me take this Gucci guy. Yeah. <laughs> a Gucci or some sort of like, you know, perfume or something. Right. And Darius Kanji, as we both know, is phenomenal. Yeah. And they made seven together and you're just like, I mean, come on. And then he went on <laughs> to use like is- his gaffer for everything. Because I think Kanji yeah. didn't shoot some stuff for Fincher. So he used Kanji's gaffer. And then they did a bunch of Heineken commercials. And then from there, they just started working together after that. Um yeah. Anyway, as well. Yep. <laughs> you know, you know how it is. It's a moving. It's a moving village. Yeah, you know, it really so. is. It really okay, is. We talked about your great, your papa, your your grandpa, who sounds incredible, and that's such a wonderful person to have in your life and to give you that inspiration. How did you know what you were gonna do at that age? Because this is something that I always like to get into. Is like, <clears throat> if you trace back your origin story, where did all these things come to, to where you are now? Like where, what was like the impetus? The, the um, original I just love watching movies. You know, I love watching movies. I, I truly, it was like one of two directions I wanted to head. I either wanted to fly jets or make movies. <laughs> and in the Ooh, end, I like both of those. What's that? <laughs> and both of those sound awesome. Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> fly jets probably be even cooler. Well, the jets thing was like really like you, I knew kind of that in a weird way, as crazy as that sounds, it's a very like set path. You know what you have to do. You got to get the grades. That's it. You got to go to the Naval Academy. I want to be Navy pilot. So, um, and my mm. great, my other grandfather, Rock my and mom's angels and stuff. My mom's father was a, was a, um, was a Navy I guess he was like almost an admiral, not, not quite, but he got, almost got there mm. Went to the Naval Academy. Wow. So I was like, wow. all right, I want to, um, I want to try to go fly jets. So it was a very like set process. Got to get the grades, got to go all the way, get the congressional nomination and stuff, which I, I went ahead and went all through all those loops. And then, wow. you know, I had a pretty good shot. I would go to the Naval Academy every summer and play uh water polo. And I just felt like, okay, I can, I can figure this out. And in the very wow. end, I was just like, man, I hate math. I'm so bad at math. I have bad eyes. Mm. I'm like, my chances of actually being a pilot are not great because in order to be a pilot, you have mm. to graduate at the tip top of your class in the Naval Academy. And those are the only yeah. guys who got to choose that role. Um, and if you don't, and all those people are engineers. And if you don't get there, you're like on a submarine. So, in the end, I was like, man, I'm, I don't think I'm going to be able to – I think I can get the grades. I think I can get to the Naval Academy. I don't think I can get in the top like 40 or 50. Um, I just hate math so much. And I like art. Yeah. I like drawing. Are you and, left-handed? No, I'm right-handed, yeah. But uh, hmm. I really – just like my art was style. like what I love doing. Um, mm. I would do a lot of like crazy. You can't escape that too. Yeah. I always say art chose, chooses you and you don't choose it. Yeah. It just is, it is a thing that kind of happens to you. Yeah. You just feel it. You're like, Oh, That's... this is where I'm really happy. Like doing this stuff. So I was like, all right, I'm going to yeah. go do film. And then, ah. 
So you you got pretty far up to oh, almost that all the way, prop- literally like wow, a few months away from you know finding out whether I was going to get accepted or not. That's a wonderful thing to think about. I didn't know that, and I, I'm loving to know more about you. But I think that also, I don't know, I could be wrong, but I think that that whole process of training and discipline and routine and all these like high level disciplines probably helped shape you for the next journey. Absolutely. You can't go off to be a director without having extreme discipline. Yeah. And I do like think extreme that, that focus. for sure has given me like that, uh, pro- and even the process of like getting to the level to try to go towards the Naval Academy was like, you know, I, I would do a lot of like community service things. And I would do a lot of like, I was the leader of my boy scout troop and we would do a lot of crazy stuff like we were great we had a crazy troop we were not like little crazy kids just scooting around we were we were like climbing the san juans and getting on the dragon of silverton wow. train and like we were doing really wild trips and pretty high wow. effort alpine you know just some pretty wild stuff and that kind of like uh just that that group work and like just the the crazy things we had put ourselves through i think made me into like a team player to a certain degree and team sports of course Mm. and that's the type Mm. of like you can be in your head and you can do all this like crazy artistic stuff but you really i think in order to get far in certain aspects of filmmaking it helps to be a team player and a people person Oh uh, yeah. I didn't realize how much of that was the role, which the role I feel like as a director is facilitating the best out of a team. Yeah, that's it. Absolutely. And it's, 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 it's a selfless job in a lot of ways, but oddly it's a very selfish job because very it is your job, vision. Yeah. 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 So it's a weird duality. I feel Absolutely. like. And yeah. Yeah. And you have to have, yeah, but you, you, you can't go too far in either way. You have to find the balance mm-hmm. or, or put on the mask for whichever role you need to be playing at the time, you know? Mm, that's a good term, the mask. Yeah, because it is a different. I remember listening to an interview that you had done, and you were talking about. I think you were giving some advice, or they asked you for some advice on filmmaking, and you said, "And I love this, and I totally agree." Is that you said when you're when you're writing and creating a film from within, at the very uh-huh. impetus and the 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 raw core intimate moment that you have with it, you create a Bible, a, like a a uh, thing to guide you through like a, a diary basically. Yeah. And that's when you have the, the biggest mind, right? I, I, you didn't say that, but it's like, you, like when you have the yeah. freest, yeah, you yeah. have the freest mind. You're not thinking about logistics and, and, and all the politics of, of budget management and stuff. And you're just thinking big so that when you go into those levels of stress, because as we both know, well, I know a little bit cause I'm entering into it. It's like, you're just inundated. Yeah. You know, you're processing things at a rapid rate, but um, we're, we're jumping in. This is, I, I mentioned that kind of forewarned the podcast will go everywhere as a conversation <laughs> okay. actually does. Yeah. But how, could you dive into that a little bit more about like your, and we'll come back to some of the origin stuff and I have some questions on that, but when you're going into making a project that comes from within, what are some of the things, the staples, the rules that you've put in into your kind of process? Um, I mean, as I get older, it changes a lot. I still always make that Bible, that diary, like that's always a big part of my process. More and more as I get older, um, that diary uh, or Bible, if you will call it, a lot of it's become pretty mechanical in terms of like where my shot maps are put and all that kind of like blocking inspiration, you know, I'll I'll fill it full of pictures and things that um, are inspiration to my process. But um, is this digital or a no, physical it's a physical, thing? it's just, uh, it's always, I always get the same, they don't even make the original moleskin one that I would use. It was like a oh, yeah. hardcover graph paper. Um, yeah. yeah so I use yeah, bigger than that. Yeah. I use the, the, the size up from that one, you know, like sure. Cause they can fit stuff in. Does it have like a grid and all that yeah, stuff? Yeah. But now I yeah. think these are great. Yeah. I have one for every single movie I've ever done. Oh, um, I'd love to and see it has that. all my super sides cool. in it and has all, not all my sides. I don't throw every side in there, but, but it, yeah, it's paper sides. It's what legal sides? or just a 11 paper size. A 11. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just fills with all my, my work, my pre-production stuff, my scout stuff. And, uh, mm. you know, now you could use an iPad for it all, but like 
there's so many times where I yeah need to be able to turn the page and feel my work in my hands, you know? Yeah. Oh, it's oh my essential. God, it's so funny. On this last film I was doing, it's like the book will move around, you know? And when I'm doing a Land movie- Land of Bad is the film, right? What's Land that? Land of Bad? Which one is Land this of the Bad, latest yeah. film you're working on? Yeah. Uh, okay. So it's so funny. It's like- Anyway, we were working late. It was a crazy day. And the book is usually by Video Village along with my master script. I have a small master script that always is changing. And it, by the time the end of the movie, it's like a ball of mud almost. It's so crazy. <laughs> but um, my book and that script are like the movie. And my – I don't know. It's like we get back to the house. It's like a long drive from the jungle in, in Queensland, Australia. And like the, I'm like getting out of the car and I like – Look to my assistant. I'm like, dude, where's the, where's the book? And he's like, <laughs> I thought you had the book. And I'm like, oh, no. I'm like, man, I am not the director of this movie. The book is the director of this movie. <laughs> what? We gotta get the fucking book, man. I'm like, I'm like, if somebody finds this book, they can ransom it for so much money. It's like, that's the director. All the ideas, all the plans, everything's in this book. Oh my god! It was like, fortunately, they were able to find it. Oh my god! Wonderful. It was out oh, of a rack location. Moment. It was so bad. It was like an hour away. Uh, oh. I almost, I was like. Yeah, I, I was like, never. So I now have you to. need like a baby Bjorn. Yeah, you have like a baby just Bjorn for chain you. Like, it to myself, right you know, um, <laughs> like a big fanny pack in the front. You just yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shame on me for assuming that. Yeah, it would always follow me somewhere. But uh, anyways, that's the that's the problem of having a non digital copy. But at the same right. time, yeah. I agree. I, I love having a physical copy. It's so important. I love the tactility of it, like being able to. Yeah. touch it as I'm yeah. going through the process of it. And a lot of times yeah. I'll write in it while I'm like watching takes and I, I don't even know what I'm writing. It's like scribble. And, mm. But for some reason Stream I can read it and I can do that. I can't do that mm. if it's digital because I can't like write on an iPad. Like, well, I'm, I don't know. I don't think I would know what yeah. I'm doing. But when I have my hand on the paper, I can write without looking at the, at the page. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways. Like that. That's a really beautiful thing, Will. I yeah. think it's wonderful no, it's that you cool. have this like intimate journey thing that you bring with you. Yeah, I'll send you That's a picture like later of all the stacks book. of them. Now there's like love from love that. onwards, there's a big stack of oh. all these books. <laughs> They're fun to look at later. And, oh, the other thing I want to say is I take – anytime I start a movie, I bring them all. They all come with me. Oh, really? So, yeah. That's Damn, like a big part of the luggage. All the books come with me and I'm able oh. to kind of like – Why do you bring all of them? All Because uh, I just – when I'm prepping, I'm looking how I did things in the past and what worked. And because it's such a. So you like to build, you don't like to remove the past. You like to build upon. Yeah. It's, trust me, man. It's so helpful to see how sometimes I like tackled something in a scene or, or like, you know, sometimes if something's pivotal, I'll write that note in the book and then I can see it. And when, when I'm trying to like plan, you know, how we're going to build a set or, you know, how many shots I can get done in a day. I can just quickly reference some other complicated thing I've done in the past and go, Oh, I did it uh, like that. So this will work this time. And, um, mm. it's really helpful. Can you recall a moment like that, that happened recently? You're like, Oh, I mean, I guess you obviously can't talk about your latest film in detail, but maybe underwater or like connecting. Um, I mean, underwater like, oh, book like, is so wild. Cause that was such a technical oh, it's film. Be nuts. Yeah. What a technical film. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I remember you're texting me like, Oh, we're doing a, uh, what is it? Night for day is a day for night. Day and for night. You're yeah. showing me some stuff day for night. And I was like, dude, this is crazy. And you're showing me like photos from the set. And I'm like, how is this happening? <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> it was so technically crazy. Oh, dry for wet. Yeah. Probably is what I was saying. Cause we were wet, doing sorry. a lot of dry yeah. for wet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that book, that book has been helpful in terms of like, you know, even, even little technical things have been useful, uh, on current movies where I'm like trying to reference like, you know, a build that maybe we did on underwater and how far we'd put a blue screen or a green screen away from something like in a set mm -hmm. design or a finished set design. And I'll have that slip of paper in the book and I'll see, oh, we did that at 15 feet away. And so if we're oh, going to okay. do this hallway and we're going to cap it we need at least 15 feet on the end of that you know anyways it's it's a there's a well, wealth of knowledge of in these books that have been really helpful so 
Oh, that's wonderful that you can keep those things along too. Cause uh, I would imagine while you're doing this, you're a production designer and you production designed uh, love is too as well, right? Yeah. 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 You were, you wore most of the a hats, lot of hats. So, but that's think, everyone's yeah, first yeah. film. You know, you, you wear all yeah, the hats. You and, have to be. Yeah. How did you relinquish control when you're moving from an independent do it yourself, everything kind of filmmaker to this now big team player and running a basic, like a village of people through a process? Yeah. I mean, that's just, I, I think it's pretty, it's, it's, if you find people that you love their work, it's like such a treat to relinquish control. You're like, you're not even doing that. You're just like so excited to see what this artist mm -hmm. can come up with or, costume designer is going to build or um, like what their inspirations are and what their process is. And sometimes I meet other people and their process is entirely different than mine. And it's so cool to see how they get all their influences and all their, um, you know, uh, inspirations and gather them. I'm like, Oh, that's such a good idea. Like I should do that. Or I love, I just love working with other great artists. Like underwater was like such a huge huge like awesome sandbox to play in in that regard working with people like yourself and um caleb alexander watt or jared purrington and all these talented people epic artists yeah epic. it was like oh so such wonderful. a fun you know and it was fun <laughs> like you know we weren't like a disney movie we weren't a marvel movie well i guess we did become a disney movie but at the time we weren't <laughs> so it was really yeah, just time, me yeah. calling artists and being like hey man can can you work on this for a little <laughs> while? And, you know, that's right. Um, yeah. When we were developing, I think the screen technology and you were telling me like, Oh, let's make up like a fake company that's running this. And yeah. what's that logo look like? And yeah. what does it feel like? And what does the arm computer feel like? And all these things, it was so fun. And yeah, you were so wonderful. I think that's really, truly what I, you know, what you love as a director. If you have a film that has enough power, you can go, Hey, I love your art. Just make something cool. Here's the sandbox and come play with yeah. me. Yeah, you know? like oh, cool. gosh, and that's that's how it felt too. It was so fun. Where it's like oh, cool. And but everyone must. Yeah. Have, your art is so cool. Every every everybody must approach you that way. They're just like, dude, we love your shit. Just make us anything. <laughs> I appreciate that. I think um, yeah, it's taking time, but I'm getting there. Yeah, yeah and that's I'm getting to the place where it's just like, um. Yeah, come and play and make art. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, awesome. cool. Like, yeah, definitely. And, and that's really where you want to be, right? So you can have ultimate power and ultimate control. So you can really contribute at the best, you know? Yeah. That was fun. I remember um you guys were sending me like the sculpted forms of the suits and all yeah. these things. And it was yeah. so fun, like coming up with different colorways. Oh yeah. The, you know, I have yeah, I have all yeah. those somewhere. I gotta pull them all back up. They're so cool. You made so many cool so renditions fun. of that. <laughs> It was just a really fun project. It was so cool to be a part of that thing. And I remember um, my buddy Jason and I, the first time I had ever seen your work was in theater. I went and saw Signal and I watched it with my buddy Jason. And we were just like, whoa, what, what the hell was that? It <laughs> felt like a Rod Sterling episode in a way. And then it, I think you even mentioned it in one of your interviews. You said you wanted it to feel quite small and intimate and then widen up and have this big contrast of worlds, which I thought was really interesting. Concept oh, thank too. you. And yeah. 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 We had a lot of fun watching it and then getting into it. And it felt like that where, um, like a twilight zone. episode. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that was your goal. Yeah. 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 Just making something that was, yeah, absolutely. Totally inspired by all the twilight zones that I love growing up and, um, you know, just having this, uh, I guess at the time, like, I don't, I guess people still use the term genre bending, but yeah, feeling like you're in one movie and then all of a sudden it's this other movie. And yeah, I love that experience. I love, I love not knowing anything about a movie and then going on some kind of strange journey. Like it's the worst if you read too much about a film and then you're like, Oh, this is yeah. what it's going to be. You know, I never read or watch trailers. I just can't. Yeah. Cause they expose so much now. Yeah. I'm like, ah, rarely do they hide things to point to the point. Like the handmaiden. Have you seen that movie? The handmaiden. I, the movie or the Korean show. Film? Oh, uh, I'm that's handmaid's the handmaid's tale. tale. No, I haven't seen the yeah. handmaiden. There's a trailer for it. That's one of the, my favorite trailers made of recent time, but it's just, it doesn't show a lot. It just kind of <clears throat> leads you through this thing. So you're asking more questions at the end of it. And I really feel like that's the point of a trailer, but 
I yeah. get it. Everybody wants to track everything off as you go through the process yeah. of doing that. Yeah, there's so much money on the line. We won a golden trailer. Or no, we didn't win. We got second place to Gravity for a science fiction trailer. Mm. Um, wow. Which was kind of crazy. But I was very, really involved in that trailer, which was a lot of fun. The only like real big thing, it does give something away at the end of that trailer. And I remember Focus Features at the time, which is like totally different company now. Um, but they were like, well, do you want people to watch your movie or not? And I was like, oh, no. So they kind of forced me to put that shot in and that's fine. I mean, whatever, but that is the eternal yeah. question. It's like, yeah, they'll always, yeah. they want to show it all. <laughs> Do you have, cause yeah, that that's, I, I can imagine and being in that kind of position where you, you have people that are paying the bills and fronting the f- funds for these things and you don't have ultimate control over these things. And then they're pushing an agenda on their side because they, <clears throat> they're being, I mean, uh, you often see this in this in this industry where you're, when I watch something, I go, oh, this is totally compromised by somebody wanting to make money. And I get that. And we all should make money on these things and the effort should be returned if it's, you know, valuable and worthy. But when you feel that in the choice making, I just go, oh, man, why did they do that? But, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, you can't. So that's yeah. A, you know, how do you deal with that? Because I mean, you own business, you know. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's a business. Yeah. Look, I. You know, you're just thoughtful of the people who give you their money to make your movies. Um, yeah. It's important. It's just, uh, I think fortunately I happen to be like a little bit more commercial than some people in some regards. So it sort of mm. works out where I'm not too out of a line with the notes that are coming in or the needs. Uh, it's tricky. My current film, one of the first notes that comes in is like, oh, we need this, you know, this is a product placement thing. And it's like, you know, I have to figure out, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I have to sort it out. I'm like, they need it in there. Do it tastefully. Yeah. yeah. And it's like where they want it is to me, I'm like, mm, can't put it there. <laughs> so I got to just figure it out, but I'll sort it out. You know, it's just, that's part of the game. Yeah. You know, that's part of the, that's mm-hmm. part of being, that's the, the people person's hat. You know, that's the psychologist yeah. hat of being a director trying to mm-hmm. roll with those kinds of, uh, cause look, I, the way I, a lot of filmmakers or younger filmmakers will even hit me up and they'll be like, Oh gosh, you know, I love these directors and they'll list all the auteurs and mm-hmm. for every auteur, there's probably a couple hundred or maybe a thousand. Um, I don't know how many, <laughs> but there's a lot of journeyman directors and filmmakers out there. You just don't hear about them as much, you know? But they're making a lot of movies, um, action movies and, you know, psychological thrillers and, you know, but the auteurs make the big ones and they make all the noise. And those are the guys who probably, if you gave them that kind of note, would be like flipping you off and telling you to go eat one. Um, yeah. <laughs> and they have the power to do it as part of their whole identity to be that way. Yeah. But true. if you want to yeah. be a working if you want to, like, it's rare to have that job. And I, you know, I never really set out to be an auteur or anything like that. I just want to be a successful mm. filmmaker and make my living mm. telling stories. And so okay. I'm not afraid to be like a carpenter or like a work and be. And so I kind of like, a, I almost like look forward to the challenges of like the stupid note that I got where I had to like figure out how to mm. put this like thing front and center. Cause it's part of the business, you know? Yeah, that's a different approach. I never really, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen it in the film industry where some directors uh, are like contract, like they're like, like you said, a carpenter, you know, yeah, or like a contractor in a sense to establish and get everything together and, and actually put the sauce together and stuff. And then you do have the auteurs as well. And there is a big divide between that based on choice making yeah. and all those kind of things as well. A big that's part interesting, obviously but do has you feel- to do with where's the inception of the idea. Like, you know, if you sure. are a writer director, this is your idea. You brought it from being, you know, a baby all the yeah. way to here. You're going to feel more. You weren't yeah, hired to do this job or whatever. In this particular case, I actually was hired to do my own film that I wrote when I wrote the signal. Land about mm-hmm. I wrote when I was a kid, basically. So, but mm-hmm. enough time has passed, and I've had enough experience now where I'm like not as precious about it. You know, I'm like, okay, I know what type of film I'm trying to make here. So, Hmm. um, that must help then to kind of reserve your emotions for the battles that you need to fight because every day is somewhat of a battle right? to achieve X goal for X time at X money and so on and so forth. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Um, it's uh, funny. Yeah, that's coming, finishing paranormal. Uh, I got a call from my agent saying, Hey, will you talk to this guy? He's going to do a film at Paramount and, and he really wants to have a chat with you and see how it went for you. And, um, oh my gosh, I'm, I can't remember his name all of a sudden. He directed Smile. Um, and that mm-hmm. film ended up being a huge box office success. Huge. Mm-hmm. And, uh, one of Paramount's like highest grossing films of late. Parker Finn. Parker Finn. His name. Parker's a super yeah. nice guy. And we knew each other through, uh, the, his DP, Charlie. And, uh, yeah, I was like, look, I'm going to tell you this. Our experiences, I'm going to tell you, it was great working with Paramount, et cetera. But I will say your experience is going to be so different than mine because I was hired to direct mm-hmm. Paranormal for them. So I'm working off of their script, off of their idea, and I need to help sure. pull all the pieces and make – Facilitating. Yeah. And his script mm-hmm. was his own original idea coming out of South by Southwest. Mm-hmm. I think he'd won South by Southwest or something like that. And I was like, no nice. matter what, it's going to be – this is your idea. So your experience with how the producers treat your idea is going to be so different. And, yeah. you know, um, I can't totally speak to how you'll feel working with people telling you what to do or how they would do it. But, you know, you got to just stick to your voice and your vision. And, and it turned mm-hmm. out really, really well for him. So I'm pretty, pretty stoked for him. Yeah. Yeah, good for him. I have not seen it yet. I had a couple of friends that watched it and really enjoyed it's great. it. It's, and I'm, I always like to keep in the dark with these things. Yeah, and I just I won't tell you like anything randomly. About it, it's a fun movie. If you like scary Thank movies, you. it's a fun movie. Yeah, I heard it was some somewhat. The one thing I heard was it's close to. It follows when the, I really I felt like it follows had a was wonderful psychological. Yeah, and it was so it's well similar like that. The score yeah, was so great. But it's definitely yeah. you know Which I love those kind yeah, of things. Yeah, if you like that kind yeah. of movie, this horror is, that's like inside your mind. Yeah, and this movie, you know, it's just a testament to. I don't know, it, yeah, it's like it follows in mm. some regards, but it's also very different in a lot of other ways. And good, um, yeah, does its own weird. I always say it's like more of a good thing is never a bad thing. I think it know? follows so feels like, yeah. was like a really amazing, amazing, amazing movie. I love it. But definitely a little more indie. The, the smile is a little mm. more, and 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 indie might be better for some people or not for other people. But sure. um, yeah, smile is more, a little more polished. Feels more like a bigger Accessible. scary yeah. movie kind of thing. Different different mm. vibe. Gotcha. But maybe mm. similar yeah. to some things. In it. It's hard to make a good. Uh, scary movie I feel like because everybody's fears are so different you know totally and um, you want to know something yeah. to speak to that a little bit underwater our initial Forgot creature design paranormal. was a was a squid <laughs> and oh, yeah. it was so hard like <laughs> man I really wanted to make squid scary because it's like we put tentacles in art and love crafty and stuff it's like you would think like okay I can I can do this I'm gonna be the guy to make squid scary and in the mm. end it's like so hard because the eyes yeah. don't really look at you. There's no teeth really that are hard. The teeth are hard to see. Right. There's no claws. And that's why at the end of the day, scary stuff, like it's, it is so hard to tell like what one person thinks is scary versus another. But when yeah. you do take a majority, like people usually tend to agree, like scary eyes, scary teeth and scary claws are scary Mm -hmm. and as dumb as that sounds it still works it's like gosh i yeah it's like i can't tell you how many times i've looked at concept art and there's no face you know and you're like oh that is scary but as soon as you get to Mm -hmm. like practically dealing with that thing chasing somebody it's interesting it's hard to feel the intimacy of the thing with no face you know but yeah yeah well i mean I mean, I, I I sent you a link even last night, and I'm, there's this guy on YouTube called Cinema Tyler, and he has this wonderful channel that he goes really into deep into like the deep dives of these things. And my all time favorite film of the genre is Alien, and I know that you love that oh, film yeah, as well. Absolutely. And, and, his, and I was as this guy's explaining this on this channel, he's articulating all of the variety of randomness that happened in order for this film to come about, which you had like. Dan O'Bannon's original script and then that was partnered with his friend and they wrote this off, off of a couch basically and then it went to a brand new wine and they changed things and then Ridley came in at the fifth director to come in and out of the film and 
all this stuff and you know Ripley was supposed to be a guy and there yeah. was all this like it's just the chaos of it and then Geiger it just seemed like it was just this weird amalgamation and and the idea I think what makes that film still to this day so damn good is because it's the unknown yeah it's the unknown that kind of pulls you along and I think that it follows is also doing that too if we tap in and using that as an example is it was like who is the one and as soon as they started opening up the box more it was like ah, I like close it out more because then it makes it more ambiguous yeah that's how I am but I'm also a person that likes to paint in my head, I'm not like every other person. I, I, I kind of continue thoughts and get on tangents inside my own brain, making my own alternative film. You yeah, know? So, right. But yeah, I, that's interesting that you mentioned that because it is also, this is something that happened to me when I was making Chimera. This is a film I just finished, the short film, but I was sitting there and I think you probably, you, I'm sure you felt this many times. You've studied film and you listen to all your favorite directors and they're all in your head, but the moment you're actually doing the act of filmmaking, it all just ran away from me. And I was like, ah, oh, fuck them. Like, this is me figuring out my problems that I yeah. have to see it sort through right now. Yeah. And you go off instinct and you go, well, how does this feel? And framing and all that kind of stuff. Do you have that in your mind or do you think of directors and how they do it? Or you just go within yourself and outward into it? No, I, yeah, I study scenes and things that I love and. I, you know, my, my wife who at the time of doing underwater was my girlfriend. Um, I was at the time I had this little iPad mini and I was like going through, it was back when you could screen grab the iPads. And, um, yeah, so I was like screen grabbing every cut in alien. And, uh, my <laughs> wife was like, I had to do a bunch of work. She's like, Oh, I'll do that. And uh, I was like, you're going to screen grab the whole thing for She's like, sure. And she didn't realize like what she was getting into. And yeah, uh, she was like, <laughs> I get home and she's just finished. She's like, never again. But anyways, I have this terrific, uh, somewhere I have, I, I'll have to every find cut. It. every single cut. In I've done that for scenes of that film too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have yeah. a whole, I'll send it to well, you. you. I have def- a Dropbox or something with it all. Please. It's awesome. I'd love to it's see so that. It's so fun to swipe through it and see the color it's shifts amazing. and the changes and oh. Yeah, just he's such an I artist. I remember learning. I remember Anthony and I were learning Da Vinci Resolve, and we were we were looking at the scopes of Alien oh, and cool. the range of color. Yeah, when you look at the scope of range of color, I inst- I instantly realized I was like, when you look at it, you go, this seems monochromatic, but then when you put it through the scopes, you're like, there's a variety. In yeah. Here. That is imperceptible. Like, I don't know. Again, I, it's I think it's a bad thing to maybe like like praise something to a God level, but there's certain <laughs> things in this world. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah. And it's I can definitely feel genius. that inspiration. I saw people were criticizing that about underwater too. How do you deal with like critics? Because it seems like critics are quite harsh with your work. Yeah, do you feel like, it, how do you deal you with know, that? Back then, I guess when I started like the signal, I would watch that stuff like, Oh my gosh. And now, now mm-hmm. you just like totally don't care later. You're like, that doesn't even matter. Yeah. Cause it's so, you know, you just like, um, the only like, yeah, just, you just don't let it bother you at all. Cause it's just like, it's such a process to even get to the end of a film. You're like, how could it's you so even allow it. yourself to, to be bummed on it or worry about it? And, and for every, uh, critic, there's always somebody who likes it. So it's like, you just like, yeah, the thing is the critics and people who just make a living or like really want to bag on something. It's totally, you know, that's just what they want to do. And, um, Mm. there's so many people who are silently enjoy things or maybe who go out of their way to actually try to find you and say, Hey, I love this or I love that. And so it all balances. There's a yin and yang to it all. So, um, Mm. I think the only time recently that I've been bothered and I won't even say exactly what it was, but there was a person Mm in my business who was uh, talking to the press about something. And it was kind of like, man, that was a little bit of a bummer. Mm, Like hearing this person bag on their own thing or something that I've been involved with. And you're just like, ah, come on. Like that, that was a little, Mm. that's like not a critic. That's a person who um, was just like got sloppy with their mouth. And it's funny, the only reason I heard about it was that person hit me up like super apologetic and was like, oh, oh, oh my gosh, oh my God, I just want you to know it wasn't about that or this. And I was like, what is this person talking about? But, and then that that was the only time I've been bothered recently. And even then I was like, I just was like, 
as much as I wanted to tell that person, like, oh, you're, you're a son of a gun. I still was just mm-hmm. like, eh, yeah, whatever. I, I'm not too worried about I it. Thank that. you. Thank you for apologizing. It's no big deal. Mm-hmm. But yeah, in my heart, I was like, oh, that's that guy's a bastard. But uh, <laughs> in the end, it's sure. like, what can you do, well, man? It, yeah. No matter what, you're yeah, creating what can art. You do? So people yeah. are going to have a, a thought on it. Yeah, and a lot of things that we love now are often hated in the beginning too. So yeah. it's something to consider. I always remember that too. I always took it a heart to heart when, because I'm a very sensitive person, and I always felt like I wanted to make everybody happy to like make them feel a certain way. And I realized that's a futile task because it's yeah. like it, it relent. It'll literally kill you from within because everybody reacts to things differently. Mm-hmm whether your intention is so or so or not. But that's one thing. And I appreciate you talking on that because it's sometimes it's tough when you're dealing in this space where everybody has a microphone and it's social media and they all feel entitled to have an opinion of something. And it's so easy to critique something. We all know this, but it's the hardest thing to actually make the thing, you know, yeah. it's unless you're sitting there in your shoes doing that thing at that time, you really have no comprehension. You could criticize aspects of a film for whatever reason, it doesn't work for you, this and that, and, and dissect it. And sometimes there's truth to that, I would imagine, and you can live and learn from those yeah. things. But at the same time, you're like, who am I trying to appeal? So what 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 makes, what's your like MO, what, what pushes you and motivates you every day to get up and get, get to the job, at the task at hand? Just love making movies. <laughs> you know, I just really love making <laughs> I movies. I love it. Uh, it's such a cool job, you know, it's your like, child is still in you. Yeah. It's I still love right there. trying to get yeah. the jobs. Like I love, I love, I'm mm. just, yeah, I just, I'm so lucky to be here. I feel like, you know, a big part of the whole critics thing. It's like, that's where a lot of kids, I went back to music school for a little while after, uh, I remember that. Yeah. After, after underwater, underwater during you, underwater. And yeah, it was tough. Like you were like really into beat making. Yeah. And stuff, yeah. I was making I a lot of music. Yeah. <laughs> lo- I'd lo- you were like in like, college. You went to college again. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Did I went back to UCLA night school like and it was fun. Like yeah. <laughs> really fun. Like learning how to Let's, do all that and learning, you know, I got addicted to buying samples and stuff and like, I own a lot of really did. cool spitfire libraries <laughs> and stuff that, Oh, me oh, too. oh, and the other Those thing the I will tell you, a lot of the music in Paranormal, I did. Uh, just uncredited. There's oh. no composer on the film, but you'll hear there's music throughout the whole thing. Yeah, I just did it. Ah. And did, got no credit, didn't, you know, obviously get paid anything <laughs> for it. But um, we didn't really have a budget to get a composer. So I just I just used stuff that I had and, and um, yeah, I just like copied other films that I kind of liked and made tones that were, you know, it's not very complex work, but it's, it's still that schooling taught me how to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, music is a, so audio and music, I feel like having gone through the process with it a couple of times and stuff, it's like, it's like more than 50%, sometimes 80% of the experiences in the yeah. audio. You don't really realize Yeah, that. and Kubrick <laughs> always said you don't really need dialogue. You just need music and picture, you know? It's like dialogue yeah. is what actually tends to... He proved that. Yeah, he's like... <laughs> yeah, he proved that many that times. That should be a bonus, like whatever the dialogue is saying, but it shouldn't be the first thing, you know? He's like the picture and the music should be first, um, which I always thought was interesting. Yeah. Um, That's an interesting approach. Yeah. Your, your, your range of... of inspiration I always felt was really interesting too. You've mentioned David Lynch and Scott and Ridley Scott and like uh, Kubrick. Do you have any contemporary directors that you admire and that you look to for inspiration when you watch their work? Uh, Villeneuve, obviously he's doing amazing stuff. Yeah. Really, what really What does his movies stuff. do to you? Like, like, uh, Jared like was let's telling talk me about maybe like, I had forgot about this shot, but in prisoners, there's a shot where the camera just like, pushes in off of the front lawn the and just goes into the tree. And I was like, I was like, yeah. I don't remember that at all. And so we watched it and I was like, Oh my God, this is so crazy. That was Roger Deakins though. Oh, I Deakins had Roger, the idea for that. I believe he mentioned something like, I, won't, I don't think he would ever take credit for certain things, yeah. but I think that, wow. But also you had to hand it to Denny for being an auteur and going, well, no, we're going to spend a couple minutes here on this tree. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Maybe <laughs> yeah. it is Deakins. I have a really crazy thought on Deakins and, I'd love to like someday find out if this is true or not. But so on my current film, I, it was kind of like a quick lesson on like second unit, bad guys, like shooting guns and stuff. It's like, I was like, Oh yeah, got to put a lot of thought into this. Cause this could just be really bad. And, uh, I was like, wow. Yeah. You can't just have baddies running out with guns. Cause it feels like an eighties movie or something. And, 
you know, yeah, just, action is the hardest oh, thing to like, capture, wow, as you know. I'm like, I've put so much energy into all this other stuff. I haven't really, I just kind of figured this stuff would work. And I was thinking, I started watching Deacon's stuff. And I think he is responsible for a lot of how those baddies go down because it's sort of similar in a lot of the movies. Like, if you think about like No Country for Old Men or in Sicario when they're in the back of the car and like they come up on the car and they shoot at him, like the guy in the back gets shot, but then he sprays the other guys with the gun. Yes. I'm like, Fargo. it's I mean, the same yeah. shot in all these movies. I yeah. swear to God, I'll have to show you. It's true. And I'm like, yeah. I wonder if Deacons has done this so much. He's just like, hey, guys, you can't just have the guy jump out and shoot. He's got to like, there's got to be no, some kinetic cause and effect of bullets flying. And um, yes. I think he's he knows how to do it. He like I think he tells the guys he's like, okay, when he comes into the hotel room here, and he reaches mm-hmm. for his gun, it's gonna knock over the lamp, and he gets shot, and then he's gonna shoot the guy in the back, in the bathroom, but then he's gonna fall and spray a Uzi. I'm like, or so or good. if you think about it, the start of Sicario, when uh, Emily Blunt goes into the room, the guy shoots at her and then sprays and his gun falls. across the side. I, I swear it's Deacon's. Because otherwise, all these directors that also, are doing the same thing. Yeah, well, I think um, to talk about Deacons and his work, I think what makes him such a master of what he does is because he really, you can tell he's really thinking yeah. at every step. You could feel the presence of thought in all his work. Absolutely, yeah. And, I mean, No Country for Old Men, I could literally watch that film all the day yeah. long and I just yeah. I take a new thing from it every time. Yeah. I'm just like, how did I not see this little nuance? It's It's such a... It's such a wonderful film to experience as a viewer, also as a, a, a director, a visionary, a storyteller. You've seen all of this ripeness. It's I think it's ultimately their best work all together ever, in my opinion. But yeah, again, that's another film, like a Holy Grail film for me. Um, but that's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, your films have so much action and so much kinetic energy. And it's something I wanted to talk to you about is how do you go through the process? Because on f- when you see uh, an action sequence in a film as a viewer, in my opinion, you kind of take for granted that it's just happening. Like if you watch Heat, like Heat has some of the best action captured in a yeah, lot of Yeah, they moments. did a great job in that. Nolan took Heat and went and did made, uh, you know, Batman basically. Like, yeah. Uh, and you can see so much of the influence. And as you mentioned just now, like how... Um, Roger's doing this bullet spray fall thing, yeah. this kinetic cut paste King of bullet thing. spray it's falling. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's so, but doesn't that make sense? Because you get shot, you get, oh, and then your hands on yeah, the trigger. Yeah, totally. You're going to yeah. have this moment. You're going to let go. Yeah. And you're going to also create chaos, which is totally really what gunfights are. If, you, if you've if you totally. seen it, and you're like, it's full on chaos. Like, not, nobody's shitting anybody. Yeah, it's nobody full just on jumps out, and, shoots, and gets shot. You know, it's like there's things happening, you yeah. know? Um, I mean, people love to see that and like John Wick and all that kind of stuff. I get that. But I mean, if you're really trying to depict violence, it's chaotic yeah, and, and sporadic and super messy. And Villeneuve, like you ever um, see, you know, like bar fights, like you're like, well, dude, they're yeah, not landing a blow yeah. on one another, but they're just laying around. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. I've yeah. always appreciated, like, I think Villeneuve, he's really good at like meditating on the before and the after of violence. And um, mm. I think that's super interesting. It's like, when when they go to that house in the start of Sicario, most of that scene is about the people in the walls, and you don't see that horrible stuff happening, of course. Or later when um, um, Del Toro is like bringing the water jug into the room and getting in that guy's space, mm-hmm. like you don't see yeah. that happening either. You're just seeing you like to, which is great. what's leading up to it, you know, or what the aftermath is of it. And I, I think that that's a super poetic way to um, deal with extreme things, you know, um, that, yeah, Remember leave when the Emily, moment Emily to your imagination, and- but then we got to enrich ourselves in like what caused it and then what, what the echoes of the, the mess leave behind, you know? He's wonderful at that. I think that that's what makes him so special is that exact thing where he uh, doesn't show. Yeah. He lets you figure out a lot. So he, what he's doing in my mind is he's saying, hey, audience, become part of this with me. Use your mind and finish the picture mm-hmm. rather than saying, here's the whole picture. You know, mm-hmm. like one of my favorite shots, I remember watching that movie and I was watching Emily and Josh arguing outside and the, usually they'll come closer and go handheld and create the friction and also they just locked it on a camera wide and they just kept it far and they were going crazy at each other. But it's this wide 
it just made them feel small and it made yeah. her argument with him feel small. It was such a brilliant psychological thing. Yeah. It's so good. I don't know. It's so rare. Um, and I think that's what you meant potentially with like the auteur approach for a lot of these things. It's like having the power and the control and then the producer is not going, you need to get close. Like, you know, and then, cause I think he said, I think then he's told, uh, Roger after they got that take, he was like, Roger's like, do you want to get close? And he's like, no, because if I have it, I might use it. Right. So he yeah. knew that you know how it is with coverage i would imagine just like you know you want to get as much as you can yeah i think ridley scott shoots like seven cameras and yeah, stuff like, yeah damn dude but, i really um, want to do make you shoot a with movie... multiple cams or just one what's up do you shoot with multiple cams usually or um this film i just did mainly one we, we had two mm. and so, you know of course crazy action scenes we try to get as many out there as we possibly could but for the most part we shot with sure. one camera um just because in some That's ways you cool. can end up moving a lot quicker with the one camera. Sometimes two cameras, you you bog yourself down trying to make them both work. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I really, I really am like, I don't know. Yeah, I really want to make a movie a little more old school, a little Kubrick style where it's just a lot of the film takes place in the medium, you know? And like, if you watch like a mean? lot of the scenes in The Shining or or the wide, you know, like, the Shining or even Space Odyssey, there's so many interesting dialogue scenes that like there's never a close up. Yeah. Like they're just sitting there in yeah. chairs talking to each other. And maybe so maybe there's a medium shot that the like it'll do the establisher and the, a lot of the scene will just stay there and then it will come in and only do like maybe maybe there's two medium shots, you know. Why do you think that he did that? I have an idea, but why do you think he did that? I just think he was, I don't know. I have some different theories. One, either he really wants you to see the world or two, he's so much of a perfectionist that like he kind of would just see it how he liked it. And then he was like, okay, we got that. Or yeah, he just, yeah, I think, I don't know. What, what is your theory? I, I feel like when, cause um, if we're talking about the shining specifically, he shoots so much wide. I think that he's trying to show you how small they are in a mm. sense where the world is much larger, larger, like when he's riding the bike right, yeah. through. And I think, you know, imagine that shot on a telephoto and it was close and it was kinetic and there was cuts between it. Oh yeah. You would never I think feel it would the, break vibe, the energy. Yeah. I think what he was trying to show you is that, the world that they're stuck within is bigger than them. Yeah. And they are just a puppet within this bigger world. Yeah, totally. And I think that when he would use a close up, he would say, pay attention to this, not only you, but the, not only the character, but you as the audience, what does that number mean? And yeah. What's right, going to happen? Right. Foreshadowing, you know, and all these kind yeah. of things. And he was a real master chess player, I think because oh, of totally. that stuff, you know? Yeah. So when you're making films and you're in the process, you're building the diary, are you, consuming because i just had greg frazier on and i asked him i said do you watch any of your other stuff for things when you're making it he said he doesn't because he it says it would permeate his mind so he's trying yeah. to he's like a guy that t- tries to re- rewrite himself and you see it in his work too it's like crazy the range that he has mm-hmm. and that's an interesting process that he does that you're additive so you're adding to it and kind of like at, at the end of rushes or dailies do you kind of go sit back in the hotel or whatever if you have time and are you watching stuff or um uh, this film i tried a lot harder to to watch the dailies uh on a on a regular basis uh of course by the very end we were just like pedal the metal didn't even have time in the last week or two um to watch anything 30 day shoot 45 day 45 days 44 45 yeah 44 um it's a lot yeah it's a lot to cover 43 or 42 i'm trying to remember but it's tough Mm -hmm. we lost a few days and then we had some really bad weather days and we got rained out. We got them in insurance, of course, but it's like, you still, even with that, like you don't get the days back. So mm. this is on Australia. Yeah. Yeah. We had, mm. it's crazy. I just went through the longest winter of my life. Cause I like had winter here. <laughs> then I went there for winter <laughs> and then I came back in time just for winter here. I haven't had a, it's summer. a good winter right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good winter. We're having, I haven't had a summer in a while. So I'm like by snow. really excited for this summer. <laughs> Um, but you uh, gotta take your wife and go out to Cancun or something. Something, yeah. yeah. We just had a baby, <laughs> so <laughs> we're probably not. Oh, traveling congratulations! He's, he's ten months old, papa. so he was born like right before yeah. the movie. But oh yeah. wow, congratulations! Thank you, little boy. Yeah, little boy. What's his name? River. River. Oh, yeah, that's a he's beautiful a little name. Potato. 
So <laughs> really funny. I didn't know you're a dad now. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Wow. He's so cool. Uh, you look like you look, you're starting to look like the dad from, um, contact oh, with the mustache. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I forget his name. What a, f- what a phenomenal film. That yeah. Was great too. movie. Yeah. Great movie. Great movie. <laughs> yeah, now you're so, becoming the dad. So there yeah, you go. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a dad. I got the dad stash and dad bod and everything. So <laughs> now you look. You always uh, been pretty fit though. You keep a regimen of working out. Yeah, recently it's been bad though. So hopefully I got to get back into. Yeah. It. I signed up for the LA Marathon, so we'll see how that goes. But oh, nice. Uh, what does that mess. entail? Uh, that just entails running, <laughs> running and walking, and <laughs> taking Tylenol during the run. That's my secret. Just take the Tylenol while you're running. <laughs> <laughs> it works really well. It's good that you're physical, though. Yeah. yeah. Taking Tylenol while you're running to thin your yeah, blood out. Yeah, they say so it, it actually hurt. lowers your body temperature. It's illegal to take, like, if you're uh, in a competition because it actually uh, will actually, like, when it drops a fever, it's doing that by lowering the body temperature. And uh, it actually works while running, apparently. But uh, I don't know. Huh. Who knows? Yeah, but you've always been pretty physical, though. Do you have like a regimen of working out kind of thing? Yeah, I just try to work out. Like when I'm serious about it, I'll try to work out almost every day, like weekday, you know. But right now, I haven't been doing that. some time so. out of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Go in the morning. Are you in edit mode right now? Yeah, on that's why I'm in this weird white mm. room. So we got all the editors. Yeah, well, are... you're in the signal right now. Yeah, I'm in the background. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You work with an editor, right? The same editor? Yeah, this is the, the last same editor times, as my last few films. So, um, mm, great. So you have like a, just a real great report. Yeah. He's an awesome guy, just super hard worker and does great work and mm. really good with action. And this is a pretty action forward film. So, mm, yeah, that's a whole different skill set. How, how did you two found each other? Um, you know, it was just like a higher thing. Like to tell you the truth, it was, uh, we we were on underwater and, and they wanted the producers wanted uh, some of the scares to be kind of heightened. And we were working with multiple editors at that point. So it was like, OK, well, we need to find more of a, a scary, you know, somebody with a lot of experience with scares. And um, yeah, Todd, it's Todd Miller. He he his name came up and came highly regarded. People were like, oh, he's great. And his his. You know, he goes way back. He like, I think his first job ever was working on Con Air. (laughs) And like, he worked on a lot of the Transformers. You know, he's a very action forward guy. Uh, But he's like a big kid. He just loves making movies too. So really good guy. Oh, that's good. What's your process like? Do you guys have dailies and you kind of pixel lex and then you kind of work through a scene and does he do a first pass or do you do a pass? Yeah, absolutely. There's like a big. Combined notes. Yeah. Big first pass. It's just you two? Um, yeah, going? this particular film is just us and the assistant editor. Uh, mm. Normally, though, oh, you man, would have assistant editor so important. You have like <laughs> your VFX editor working with your main editor, and you know, it's a, with some movies they'll always have like two main editors working. So it really, yeah. But for us specifically, when we're shooting, he's cutting right away, so that way mm-hmm. he can kind of get at me while I'm working and be like, "Oh, dude." Oh, you need to get this shot or you need this, you know, you need to pick that up or Mm. fix that. Oh, that's interesting. So he's helping you almost like a, like through lining it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. While you're working. So he's sending messages and like, Hey man, he'll send me a clip and be like, yeah, you really need to go back and you you should try to fix this, you know, while you're shooting. He's out in LA as well. Yeah. Are you guys in like Northern LA area? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's interesting. I remember, um, I think it was Gareth Edwards when he made Monster. He was filming it randomly. Uh, not randomly. Oh, right. Wanna, Over time, take, yeah. But there, he had his director or his editor with him as they were going through Mexico filming it. And they were editing wow. as they were going in a sense. I think that was the case. Cool. Uh, I'm trying to get him on the podcast. But, yeah, he's um, cool. Think, what is he I up to? I wonder what he's working on. I know. I want to know. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he did such a phenomenal job. I oh, know that yeah. what a, that's such a great like all film, place. very spiritual. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Excuse yeah. me. Salute. Sorry. Bless you. Yeah. Yeah, you're getting that long winter cold. Oh yeah, jeez. Good lord. <laughs> the tenth, the twelve month winter. <laughs> you're in the Alaska stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. The longest winter. Um, your what's your favorite place to be on set? Like when you're like 
what, what, what's your favorite thing when you're, when you're actually doing your role in the art form and you're in the middle of it, what's your favorite place to be? Uh, I mean, just shooting, right? I like shooting. I, just, Are you I don't really sit behind the monitors. Bigger? I just stand like right by where we're shooting, where the camera is and just, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'll start like there's videos of me yeah. like squirreling around and dancing around. I get very like in my space, like I'll move a lot. <laughs> People are always laughing because so like crew will always produce these images of me like wiggling around, but uh, I mean I, that's you're just, in there. Yeah, you just get into it. Um, mm. My friend Jared, who came with me on to this film, another terrific, was Jared on Underwater. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was your producer, right? Yeah, well, he was associate producer, and then I got him an EP credit on this one, so he boarded the whole film. Nice. And um, yeah, he's such oh. a, a solid creative. And, That's off to Jared. Yeah, he's yeah. he's so good. So. Uh, and he's just he's such awesome. a great, you should, you should get him on your podcast. He's such an interesting yeah. creative, um, Love to. but we have a lot of fun and, and, uh, yeah, he came down and ended up living with me. So my wife would come out with the baby every once in a while, but it was just Jared and I living in this house, like barbecuing and, <laughs> out um, in Queensland. Yeah. Out in Queensland. Mm. Uh, we were in the yeah. gold coast. Nice. It was fun. We had, a, we had a really good time. But, uh, beautiful out there yeah really really pretty i mean again it was their winter Similar so it's pretty rainy but um mm. it was cool yeah and 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 how do you how do you manage this work-life balance do you, are you able to do much of that or is that difficult to do no it's right now it's not too bad it's like i mean with my job traveling is always tricky but i'm fortunate where you know as a director you only work every two years so um, mm. the rest of the time, ideally you're at home or editing and you're near home. So, um, I'm sure mm. as my kids grow up, it'll be trickier, <laughs> but for now, yeah. for now it's working out. Okay. The, so. They'll become part of the village then. Yeah. 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 What's your top five films? Top five. Top oh films, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah, my, I know that's difficult. Top two are Chinatown and Casablanca. Mm. Uh, oh really? Those are my favorite Why are those films. two? I, I love those the two? mood of, uh, Chinatown, like, I just love the mood. I love, I don't know if it's the music or the mystery and the way you feel like you're on this journey with these characters. You don't totally know where everything's going to end up. And I like the historical part of it where you're like, yeah, that's, I guess Casablanca is kind of historical too. I like, yeah, yeah human are. stories set in a place and time. time, you know, it's like, um, mm. yeah, I just love, I love the feeling. I don't know. I love the feeling of Chinatown. You watch it often? Like at least once a year. And then Casablanca, yeah, I long really films. love the feeling. Like that's like this just mm -hmm. fills me like it's a it, like if I feel homesick or something, I can watch Casablanca and just feel very like I don't know. Just I love I love watching the old actors like work and I love mm -hmm. I don't know, it just makes me feel good. It's like one of those films. I, I don't have too many of those, but Yeah. That's a romantic era of cinema too. Yeah, such just, a romantic area. The, they had so much power. Um, yeah. And films had such a presence in the psyche of America and the world at large. Yeah. Too. Yeah. yeah. That's, that innocence is definitely gone. What, what are your <laughs> top, uh, top three or four? Oh, shit. Uh, that's tough to do. I'd say obviously we mentioned Alien and No Country for Old Men is up there. There will be blood. <laughs> Fargo, American Beauty, yeah, all those kind of films. Yeah, oh, those awesome. are like definite films that, that I love. I was just listening to Thomas Newman's score last night. Oh, cool! Just on, I, and I was just listening to the uh, Rose shot song over and over and over for like four hours. It was awesome. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I just the, the sonic sound. I don't know. Like the first time I ever watched American Beauty, I was quite young. I think I was like. 14, 13 yeah. or so, and I watched it in the theater, and I was like, "What did I just watch?" And yeah, I, just, I went went and got another ticket went right in and watched it again three times wow so six hours i just kept watching oh my it and gosh it changed my life yeah wow <laughs> i didn't know that films could do that like, yeah i know i i I'd known films would do things but i didn't realize they could do that to me i was like wow what is this i don't really like watching films a second time it's really rare uh the only oh, really? film that i really wanted to see again after i watched it like right away was uh what is the film Oh man, it's the one with George Clooney. It's a Coen Brothers film, and they're like, "Oh brother, where art thou?" Oh brother, where art thou? Yeah, you watched that multiple times. <laughs> I don't know. I watched it. I, I like. I really wanted to watch it again. I didn't watch it right away. Right away. Well, I really yeah. like. I remember thinking, "Wow, this is so weird." I like really want to see that film again. 
random. They make such rad films. Yeah. There's, yeah, their scale and range is just bizarre and wild. Oh, it's and so, so cool. wonderful. Did you like Matt's influence from um, Chinatown in the new Batman? Did you? What did you think of that? I didn't even know it was influenced by it. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, yeah, yeah that was like that. one of Matt's biggest influences. Oh, wow. For okay. The Batman. Interesting. He, you know, because I think with the with Chinatown, you had all of these different things that right. were happening. Right. Yeah, kind of happening kind of and coming, coming together. Into awareness I could it. see how that narratively. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I think a lot of what I love what, about Chinatown. Did you like that film, the latest one? I did. did you, yeah, did I enjoyed watch it? it. Yeah, I mm-hmm. thought it was cool. Yeah. Um, Interesting installment. Yeah. No, I, I really did. I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was beautiful. Can you imagine and, making that film? Can you imagine making that film? Like how big that is? Oh, like gosh, how the yeah. presence, like <laughs> just wild. The yeah. weight, yeah. And to write it too, and to, yeah, oh, it's yeah, just insane. Yeah. Is that a goal of yours to to do take on a project of that kind of magnitude? Or I mean, I would. I think I would love to do it. I just, you know, I I, have, yeah. I try not to. I I don't know. I guess I'm on such a journey now, where it's like whatever happens, happens. You know, if I ever run down mm. that, I'm sure whatever road leads me to that will make me happy and willing to do that you know um if i do Beautiful. weirder smaller films then that that's where i'm headed i have no idea so uh, you don't have like a set path that was one of my questions like do you have when i was like younger a, some, i think some i of did us... now i think i just really just love um you never really know because you never really know what the industry wants and like what it's trying to get yeah and so you have yeah. to stay limber to try to uh mm. So you reserve your emotions so that you're not let down. Is that what you're doing? Kind of like, well, that's like, I think that's not really like that. It, it, I don't think emotionally, I just mean more. So you're ready to capitalize on opportunities, you know? Um, mm-hmm. I think pretty early on, if you want to be a filmmaker, you have to not reserve your emotions because unless you don't want to do things that make people unwilling to work with you, if you're like a mean guy or you're, you have to yeah. be a no tour to get away with that shit. Um, but you really have to put yourself out there every single time. So no matter what, if you're not willing to be let down, you're not going to get very far. Cause you got to be let yeah, down true. quite a bit. Um, otherwise you're yeah. not going to put the work in, you know, um, it's, yeah. it's too, you know, but what I, what I more so meant is just being ready to capitalize. Like everyone, most filmmakers mm-hmm. probably have a, a drawer of ideas, you know, and, um, you never know what your agent is going to bring you. So you kind of just really have to mm. be limber and willing to, unless you are no tour who literally like, this is the only film I'm doing next. This is what's happening, blah, 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 which is pretty cool. Those, sure. those guys got it made, but, um, yeah, well, they decide that, I guess they just kind of focus their energy on it, yeah. I guess. But then, like you said, it could lead to a catastrophe because they're just putting all their eggs in one basket. Yeah. Or so. there's all the auteurs yeah. you've never heard about. <laughs> You know, yeah, which is a, a sea of them, as an you ocean mentioned, of you know? them, probably. You know, so I watched this film I never even heard of. It was called The Worst Person in the World by this. Oh, I, I heard that's cool. Norwegian I haven't or... seen that. Yeah, amazing yeah, film. Yeah, I want to see Wonderful. that. Wonderful, just simply. I think you'll really love that's it. The streaming, tonality. right? I could stream that somewhere. I think it's on Hulu, I okay. believe. Yeah. Check and I watched out. all his other films and I was like really blown away. And I never heard of this director. I've never heard of this thing. And I'm like, how is this brilliant film yeah. just hidden here from my sight? And it was really, I, 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 I'm a very weird, I like films in a very weird way. I like yeah. weird stuff. So if a film, you know, this, it's this like fifth dimensional thing. If it moves my emotions in a certain way, I think, Oh, it's got this gold thing yeah. that I can't even equate to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's how I feel but about I, Chinatown. I it's like one. there's a fifth dimension in that mm. film. We'll hear like the guys like raking the leaves or cleaning the windshield Mm -hmm. and you hear the squeaking and I don't know. It's such a, ah, that sounds so interesting, but yeah, there's a, I think it maybe that you're saying is the world then, right? It's like the world that's been the color, the world, the way the actors hold themselves. Like, like there's something different, you know, Mm -hmm. it's very vintage feel that I love about it. It's like going into an antique store and like the smell, you know, that's cinema. Yeah. yeah, I was rewatching Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner, the other day, and it's like when they're in um, Bas- Sebastian's house, mm-hmm. and I'm just sitting there going like, "The set design and this is insane! Like, I yeah. can't believe the t- the textures yeah. of just that set with all the mannequins and like, so, like a pool table covered in like all this madness. And yeah, just so brilliant. And you watch the stark difference between that and then Denny's film with right. Keegan shooting, 
and Jordan's difference, you know, like when shooting the original one, I'm like, my God, this, the difference in craft and the difference yeah. in approach, it's just so insane. Apparently, do you so still, do you, I knew the art director, David, shoot, I've on read. Blade Runner? Yeah. Or the latest one, uh, 2.49 on or the original, the original Blade Runner. And he was telling me oh, okay. Ridley would like oh. walk in and be like, no. And then it's supposed to shoot like that day. You're like, no, nah, it's not enough stuff. <laughs> He's like, in these yeah. columns, there's more detail up there than there is down here. He's like, I need them all flipped yeah. over. And uh, they'd be like, it's going to take too much time. So he'd be like, they said one day he, he had to do so many changes that he like, he walked out of the stage and he walked to the stage next door. And like, <laughs> there's like something else was supposed to go in there, but, and they were coming to like shut him down or something. So he said, uh, he wanted all the shit moved from that stage and into this stage um, before the producers got there, so they couldn't see, and they thought that it had been shut down. <laughs> so he like, <laughs> he got everyone like working all night to like move the set to this other stage without telling anyone, so that the Amazing. producers thought it had been shut down. But he just kept shooting the next day in this other stage. Anyways, brilliant. Yeah, that's that's filmmaking, right? <clears throat> it's just like you're going against it, and you just hope you have a, a group of people that are down to just fight totally. for it because yeah. It's yeah, you're you're all bleeding no matter what. It's a bleeding process in a in a yeah. beautiful way too. Absolutely, yeah. that's so cool. I love those stories because when you look at those shots, especially like when they're in there and he he first encounters Rachel and you, that whole sequence and that whole world, it's just amazing. And the, and the old the old lenses that they use, that was all Panavision stuff too, huh? I those think old, so. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know what lenses they use, but I'm assuming. I mean, you're Mister Panavision. We I didn't know. even talk I, about that. I should that have a too. better historical. Uh, I'm sure everyone back then was using Panavision anamorphics, so I'm sure it's all the C yeah. series and E series. I think it was a C series. Yeah. I think that's what I read, but who knows? At Those this are point. the really hard the ones to get though, these though. days. They're like impossible. They're so but hard. All do that you still old play with that class. stuff? I mean, you love. You're still in. Are you still? You're obviously connected to them. I, I remember reading somewhere recently that you said that working for and with Panavision for those years was like film school for oh, you because you got to test yeah. I owe them all of my stuff. career for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, they gave me everything. So, um, I don't, I keep, hear they're a great company too. They're, they're awesome. All those people over there, David Dodson, and, uh, Bob Harvey, I think Bob's retired now, but they were, they're all so, um, responsible for me even remotely making it. So, um, but yeah, I don't keep on top of the tech as much as I should. You know, the camera tech has changed a lot. Uh, we so thought, much. How could you? Yeah, I mean, I should. I was like an imaging tech at the turn of of HD. I was sort of like. I remember hearing about that. You like yeah. built some sort of array to process the HD footage or something like that. Um, yeah, I had all. Yeah, it was crazy. I like built this whole little <laughs> computer to capture all this crazy stuff. And anyways, <laughs> it was wild. I love but, that. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you so you don't you, you don't mess with that? What body do you guys end up using? We use the that? LF on this one, the Alexa LF. Mm. Yeah, mm. I've heard great things about that beautiful, body too. Beautiful it's camera, range, yeah. Right? And it has yeah. the like you know medium format look or the large format sensor. So, what sensor size is it? Medium. It's a it's it? a large. It's full frame. Full frame sensor. Full frame. Okay. Yeah. Great. So yeah. big beautiful data. Beautiful camera. Did you guys shoot anamorphic with this one? We no, we shot the. <sighs> We shot the, we shot their 60 mil series. So the Panavision 60 mil lenses that they use for their uh, large format camera. So that's not anamorphic, it's spherical. It's a spherical lens for the 65, the Alexa 65. Mm, okay. So cool. it's, it was more lens than we needed, but with the four full frame sensor we needed to have that. And it's a really contrasty lens, um, but mm. it's sharp, you know, it's like beautifully sharp. It's very like mm. David Fincher sharp. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you want to, do you like that look? I think it's a like, really good starting I place. I don't, I don't really like, mm. yeah, if you have some C series anamorphics, that's going to look great. But I don't mm. like starting with like, <laughs> a lot of people will shoot these cheap anamorphics and I, I don't always like, like starting with mm. that low a res. Um, I'd yeah. rather have it real crisp and then I can, I can bring it down mm. if I need to, but degrade it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. 
But that only, you know, I don't know. A lot of people, like, you could argue that the red is, like, higher res and crispier and yeah. contrastier. But I, I don't really like that look, so. No Country for Old Men was shot in, like, seven, or eight, like 1080 or something. Wow. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And I always look at that film and I always go, like, well, if this looks great, then why not? Yeah. You know? and then, I think it's so funny. Underwater, think, we, we did it on 2K. And it's like, we shot it yeah. on Alexa 65. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> And That's then we awesome. just like finished it on like <laughs> nine, like two K. It's like I don't and know. I, you know, honestly, when I watched the film and I watched it in theater and I watched it at home and I've watched it on my phone even and I it, it all from all the ranges, even in the theater, I felt like it just had such a beautiful richness to the visual tonality to yeah. it. So I think it's got a uh you managed to acquire that really beautiful depth. And I believe um you shot that anamorphically, right? I think. That one was anamorphic for the most part. Which and one? Like a blend, uh, underwater. Yeah, blend. It was a blend. Yeah. So you couple like and then different ranges of of squeeze factors and yeah. stuff. I think. Yeah. Yeah, but I think uh, signal was all anamorphic though, right? No, it was it was a blend as well. No, blend? mainly mainly spherical two four zero. Uh, no, shot at one eight five. Uh, one eight five spherical, but we used a little anamorphic in there. Trying to think of what time, which scenes you shot anamorphic. Well, definitely when the flipped you decide, over upside down shot was anamorphic. You know what's weird is this is before I even know what anamorphic was, and I saw that shot, and I saw it in the theater, and I said, "You know how it is when you see a scene or something happens, and you go, what is? Why is this feel yeah. different?'" What? And that was I remember that I was like, "Yeah, that was anamorphic." Just the bokeh yeah. and like the swirl and stuff. I actually built my. I think I was telling you I built my own system. And I'm I'm using like these old Russian like Helios 44 twos oh, cool. as my main taking lens, and then yeah. running that through a two X <clears throat> anamorphic, and then like a front variable adapter. Oh my gosh! And wow. the this the you know like have you shot with like a, a like the mirror and all those like 44 twos, those little small no, Russian no. lenses? Greg was using them. I didn't even realize it, but Greg used them to throw onto the Batmobile when they're shooting the action scenes. Wow. And they false, they false. I think I could be wrong, but I think they made the false bokeh by putting the aperture with the fake, um, you know, aperture that has the squeeze factor oh, in it. Too funny. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you, they have mods for that. Yeah. But you can then do they have that because it's cheap you can lenses. Make lightning bolts. And, yeah. 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 Exactly. But the the boat the the way that those the lenses work they they have this really interesting way of bending mm. and creating like a cat's eye anamorphic kind of well it's this in the spherical but then when you throw it through the two x it just really oh cool so cool yeah and I, I just love all this kind of stuff yeah absolutely so I keep telling you I'm like let me let me be a second unit even BTS on one of the <laughs> projects I'd love to just come I'm out and think, I think out. I'm yeah. shooting Thursday night some crazy like pickup shots for in an old jet down in Long Beach for the movie I'm working on. So that should be kind of fun. Amazing. You so you're still shooting for getting coverage and stuff like that. I never stop. Like even underwater, all the inserts, yeah. like there's tons of inserts in that film. I had to shoot. We just shoot them on my office. It's like, <laughs> gotta get the movie done somehow. So wow, I love that. If you, I know we're going to wrap up here cause you know, you're on your kind of like your lunch break here. Um, and I do appreciate your time. Yeah, I know this has been fun. I know that, Myself and a lot of people that are watching your trajectory and your film or your film career. Uh, and I, and I know it's kind of hard to do this, but do you have advice for us as we kind of go through this journey? I know you've already mentioned quite a few really pinnacle things that I think are hopefully everybody's listening to, but is there something that you wish you could tell yourself when you're starting out that would might help, might, might give you some aid where you are now? I think honestly, um, I don't know. I think what I would say is now try to avoid, you know, it's not the critics necessarily, but try to avoid as much of the like, of like getting caught up in the social media aspect of it. Cause it's like before we didn't have that and we were sort of lucky cause we've got to just build on the idea yeah. that we were tracing Beautiful. our passions and not really comparing ourselves to others and worrying about what other people were up to. We were just like, mm-hmm. we were just trying to make cool stuff and, social media like anything else is a terrific tool and place to, to connect and share stories like we're doing right now. But at the same time, you want to just like do you and, and chase your dream and your inspirations and your ideas. And before, you know, the internet was as powerful as it is now, we kind of just did that, you know? And, uh, yeah, that's like With a friends really and family and just made it. cool, authentic, 
powerful energy to that desire to create films or tell stories and then to not really worry at all about like where you are and your path compared to somebody else is so important. And I think, it, you know, going back to music school and seeing kids like so worried about their friends or their, their, you know, other people who had just graduated who were doing this and, well, I'm not doing that yet, or I'm worried about this, or it's like, wow, man, you're, there's so much wasted time and worrying about your position to that where back then we did have those, but they were like more macro or they were like, oh, I got to get into film school or, you know, you were worried about like certain points, mm-hmm. but they weren't micro transactions. So it was like, you were able to, you know, you were able to just sort of like be you. And I think that's important. And now that I have a son, I'm like, yeah, it's mm-hmm. going to be interesting to try to try to give them mm-hmm. some of that purity of, of inspiration and, and, uh, uh, like motivation, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I love that. So quieting the noise, you know, totally. I had this analogy the other day. I was, I was traveling with my wife and we were going, we were traveling up to Sacramento and uh, we were, driving and this woman was smoking a cigarette in like the smoking zone at the airport outside. And I thought that's weird. I don't see a lot of people smoking cigarettes anymore. And I, and then for some reason I started to think about social media and I connected the two. And I said, I thought that when smoking first occurred in common culture, it was, we didn't, they didn't know the health hazards. It was like, Oh, it's just a casual thing that you did. You did it socially. You got out of work to do it. You were able to have this thing. It was like a release. It was also this dopamine thing. It was all these things mm-hmm. and it became this addicting thing. I think in 10 years, we're going to look back at social media in a very similar light. All the mental health issues it's causing, the lack of identity, all of the noise it's creating. Our our minds are not designed, as you mentioned, to be taking in that much feedback yeah. at all times. It's way too much. And as you said, it takes away the purity of intention Mm -hmm. because, and the same thing, like you said, you like to cultivate that purity Mm -hmm. when you're writing a script and you're building, you have this diary to go back and go, when I was pure in thought and mind, this is what I felt and coming back to it. And I feel like social media, especially for the younger generation that's coming up, I feel so bad that with like the AI stuff that's happening, it's just like, I have kids, I have younger guys that are amazing talent and they're just doubting everything. And I'm like, yeah please like, please don't doubt yourself. Like, please know that you have a place in this world. Yeah. And, and, and be sovereign to yourself and who cares if people don't understand you and don't get you, you're, you know, like you said, just follow your bliss, which is, yeah. Yeah. I love that. I was a swimmer. And so like a lot of swimming was just the, like they didn't have like uh, waterproof earbuds or anything like that back then. So like, it was like two hours after school every day of meditation because you're just churning water. Just that's it. It's like you're you pop up for, you know, mm. when you'd reach the end of a two hundred or something, and you'd be there wow. for like a minute talking to your friends or whatever. But then you're back underwater for ten minutes, and it's like <laughs> I think that was a big part of like learning to just kind of like focus and find that like inner thing. And I think. Um, I haven't swam in a while, but I'm like, I was thinking about the other day, I was like, whether any kind of exercise sure. or whatever, but they're all helpful in helping uh, burn out those like excess willies, I guess you could say, and just focusing on the, yeah. on the now, you know? I love that. That sounds, I mean, I, I'm really into cycling right now and I've been into time trial cycling and that's a oh, meditative, cool. put your, put your head into it. I'm building a crazy bike right oh, now. It's that's like cool. a, it's like a formula one bike. Yeah. On the road, <laughs> you're out on the road or. Wow. Yeah, unfortunately, there's no tracks around here. Yeah. I, I wish I was closer to like, like an a thing, right? Though you can put them on like a mountain, like ride in your garage or whatever. Yeah, trainer. Yeah, yeah, I train every day. I ride at least an uh, hour. And now I'm gonna as I get into the next phase, I have to do at least an hour and a half to two hours of um. There, there's all these things like FTPs wow. and zones and stuff. So, yeah, um, but I like it because it's just like. Well, fuck off world. I'm in it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very getting cool. into it. And the same thing, it's like when you're when you're faced with, with false pain, which is like this pain that exists in social media of like the unconscious, like, oh, I want to be this or I'm not doing this. Yeah. When you're faced with real pain of putting yourself through that like yeah. okay, well I'm grinding, 
none of that stuff matters. Totally. Like, eh, yeah. Silence. You just silences it out. Yeah. So, absolutely. Yeah. I always, I always encourage everybody to have a physical thing. Absolutely. Last two questions. Last two questions is, uh, number one is a question I always ask everybody. And I think it's a very important thing to meditate on is what are you most thankful for currently in your life? My family. Yeah, for sure. Without <laughs> question. They're the ones that, that, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, very, very thankful for my family. My, my little, uh, new son river, he's such a potato and, and my wife, Sam, they're, they're like the grounding force for sure. So most <laughs> thankful for that. I love that little potato <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh, and also yeah and your your family who's helped build who you are yeah, which is wonderful absolutely and supporting you through the process it's a very selfish act i think being a director and if and if and a filmmaker i would imagine and an artist you know it's a thing that you do intrinsically and by your own thing you know yeah. it's and it, 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 it encompasses and takes in a whole world which is really difficult so totally that's awesome and the last question uh see if i can do this but i always like to ask my guests who they would nominate to come on and talk on the podcast so if there's somebody you can think of that um oh, i would say talk to jerry interest. he's such an interesting guy to talk to more interesting than awesome. me for sure <laughs> Jared Perrin. he's another successful artist like yourself who's just working at the highest levels um doing a Love lot that. of it he's not what he does a lot of people don't really hear about because it's kind of behind closed doors but you could talk to him about it and, and he works at such a high level. I'm always impressed with the stories and the creative influences and, and he loves to talk. So <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> well, well, since he's your buddy, it'd be nice if you wouldn't mind putting absolutely. us in touch. I would love absolutely. to have him on the show. And, yeah, yeah, you should. I loved having interesting people. Yeah. Here, you guys so. are both such terrific artists. It'd be cool to hear you guys mm. chat it out. So we're blessed to, to, to work with you and to be a part of your journey. And, oh, thank um, you. Yeah. I'm l- really looking forward to us working together at some point Absolutely. And some capacity too. So Absolutely. Yeah, whenever just, yeah. Thank you so much. Will. Thank I you, really buddy. No, you. this has been a pleasure. So yeah. thank you for having me. Yeah. Have a great day. Cheers. You too. <laughs> Cheers.